Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we are going to be talking about Colorado with Colorado resident Brady Van Sickle from Broomfield, Colorado. Brady, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you know, we had a good podcast last year. I think it was during elk season. You gave a good elk, uh, Colorado elk hunting update, what was going on with the rut and such. So I thought I would double back and get you on for this uh, regulations breakdown, units breakdown in Colorado. We've got an application deadline of April 7th, and I uh, wanted to make sure we got you on here and talked about uh, your home state. Uh, before we do that, uh, why don't you give a, a brief introduction of yourself, a uh, little bit about your passions and what have you, and we'll dive right in. Definitely. I appreciate it. Uh, name is Brady Van Sickle. Um, like you said, I was born and raised here on the Front Range of Colorado. I grew up elk hunting, deer hunting, um, waterfowl hunting, and upland hunting. Nowadays, I uh, spend a lot of time chasing my my two little kids around, and and then whatever is left over after the work is is spent in the field. So whether it's scouting or trying to help other people out, or uh, you know, I I jump in and help a couple of buddies that have some outfits, and if they got an overflow of clients. I'll jump in and help them out from time to time. But um, yeah, just a, just an ordinary guy that that likes to spend time in the woods. Brady, as a general question, um, and we've got a bunch of Q&As from listeners as well uh, and Instagram followers that we're going to hit at the end of this podcast, so guys, stay tuned. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in general, you know, from, from growing up to now, what kind of trend would you say, if, if you had to take an overall trend line, uh, on on Colorado as far as, you know, uh, judging trophy quality, uh, opportunity, overall experience, number of, of animals, you know, would you say it's, it's a relatively the same? Uh, are you noticing it trending down, trending up? Uh, where do you think we are in that cycle? Um, for, for the most part, I think, unfortunately, Colorado's fairly on the decline. Uh, you know, this this opportunity for the wolf to to be reintroduced here could only could only mean worse things to come um growing up as a kid it was it was not uncommon to go into the over-the-counter units um and have a, a quality opportunity to shoot and say a 300 class bull um any more so it's there's so much more pressure in the woods um you know you, it, it's one thing to outwalk the next guy but then you're finding that you can get into your deepest haunts and, and run into somebody else, and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it pays for conservation. The money goes, you know, right back into it. Um, but for the most part, I think we're on a decline, whether it be pressure or development. Um, a lot of these private sectors having outfits and kind of, you know, kind of protecting their lines, and once the animals get bumped onto there from the public stuff, uh, it, the animals have a hard time leaving there. Um, you know, so it's, it's sad to say, but trying to walk into an over-the-counter unit anymore and say find a 300 class bull is it's pretty tough um i mean there's a lot of work it's, it's not saying that it can't be done it, it happens quite often but not nearly as much as i'd say it used to 10 15 years ago you know i think um with the private property you know the, there's always been private property there in colorado and ranches and what have you but i think the more uh, the better the hunter gets and the more pressure that the hunter applies to those forest service areas and some of the stuff that wraps around private, uh, it just tends to push those animals on private. I actually uh, operate uh, a, a, for a family down in southern Colorado on a ranch uh, during hunting season, and so I get to see it firsthand. Um, but it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, those those animals, those public animals um, get quite a bit of pressure and a lot of times on those private properties they, they just seek shelter and, and seek as much solitude as they can and a lot of times they can find that on those uh, private chunks. I think one of the things about Colorado that makes it so special is there are some private chunks that also allow some animals to get big and you know the public does end up getting some opportunities whether it be migration or you know just for whatever reason those animals moving around and I, I think for the last, you know, 10, 15 years, guys have really honed in on trying to figure out where the different, anim, you know, more mature animals are and where they might find some of those honey holes. And I know you as a resident uh, probably spend a lot of your time trying to figure these units and figure where you're going to go or maybe you can get into a little pocket that's, you know, maybe sandwiched between a couple pieces of private and, you know, you've got good animal movement back and forth. Um, 
So I know Colorado is uh, tricky compared to, say, like Arizona, where most of our land is public land, uh, and you don't have those big tracts of private where those animals can go seek uh, shelter. Uh, but it's going to be great to uh, pick your brain here. Um, look forward to doing that. I'd like to start out here. Um, I know sheep and goat, uh, you know, a subject to draw on all of that, and I know you have some experience, but you you know, you your bread and butter is, say, the deer and the, and the elk. Uh, but I want to start out talking about some of the sheep units uh, in the state of Colorado and maybe have you mention a handful of units that, uh, you know, or you think maybe people ought to look at maybe a little better than others, even, even some units that maybe you think uh, uh, the quality might not be as good, but maybe a little bit better drawing opportunities or anything like that, and, and do the same with goat, and then we'll kind of dive into the meat of the elk and the deer. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, going back to Colorado real quick, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the private sectors that previously were kind of, you know, friends and family type thing um, with, with crop on the decline and, and such like that and cattle on the decline uh, as far as price goes, you know, a lot of these ranches are seeking some extra revenue and, you know, the outfitters come in and it's an opportunity for both parties to make some money and manage the herd and, you know, coming from an elk's mindset, you know, coming off a of public ground where every ridge you hop over, there's going to be either two or three arrows coming at you or two or three bullets coming at you versus getting down on the private sector and, you know, you might have one bullet come through a day just because it's being managed properly. It's, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense why the elk do seek refuge down there. And, you know, even the deepest haunts is uh, any more so you got, you know, the campaigns type that have done a, a lot of really good things for the sport and, and for, the, uh, for the industry. Um, it's, you know, he's provided a lot of motivation for guys to put in that extra work and, and make the extra work to get into the back country. And with his books, he's, he's been very transparent on how to achieve those type goals. And so there's just, with the added information out there and then, uh, you know, the revenue to be made for the ranchers going through an outfitter or working with an outfitter, it's just, it's changed the game dramatically. And it, 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 it's not impossible for an over-the-counter or walk-in walk -in guy to get in and, and put an animal on the ground. So it's just, it's just the change of the world, and we just got to find a way to adapt to it, like you said. Yeah, for sure, 100%. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, let's, let's dive into some of the sheep stuff. Um, what kind of sheep experience do you have in your home state there, and have you drawn your personal tag yet? You know, I haven't. Um, I've, been, I've been stacking points. I'm in the weighted area now. Um, it's just kind of finding the right time to chase after it. Um, I, a really good buddy of mine who actually works as a division wildlife officer uh, ended up taking a three-quarter curl ram last year. Uh, he had uh, a full curl that he was watching and made his stock around, and about halfway through the stock heard a gun go off and immediately pulled up his glass and watched his full curl rolling down the hill. <laughs> Moved over to the next drainage, had a seven-eighths curl uh, scouted out, moved in on that one, and someone took that one out from right underneath of him, and he ended up on the last day of the season coming out with a, uh, a three-quarter curl ram and, and was actually really happy with it. So, um, you know, as far as myself, I, I, I keep tabs on multiple bands um, and different units and have fun watching them, and I'm really looking forward to the opportunity whenever I, I do decide to pull the tag or actually start seriously pursuing the tag instead of just stacking the points for it. Um, there's there's some really nice rams in Colorado for sure. Yeah. What about goats? Have you been out look goats much? Yeah, actually, um, I've been on two goat hunts. Had a lot of fun on them. You know, as weird as it sounds, the the goat in Colorado isn't necessarily the uh, the most elusive game. Um, <laughs> not to not to say that it's an easy hunt just because of the terrain that you're covering. But once you actually get a, a, a goat picked out, depending on the unit you're in there's a good opportunity you're going to be able to walk almost essentially a straight line to them and, and get the job done. They're not, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the units in the southern half of the state, you get some skittish, some skittish goats, but for the most part, they, um, they're not really elusive and they're not really shy about taking off at first sight. So they, uh, it's an interesting I, tag to, to pull. You know, you wait once in a lifetime and, and then you get it. And I've had multiple buddies go and was actually on one goat hunt and we got up there and, my my buddy ended up walking up to about eight yards and taking the goat, and so uh, it, it's interesting, you know. Kind of looked at him, and he's like, as excited as he was to have his goat on the ground, it was kind of like, well, like that was it. Anticlimactic. Kind of, yeah, yeah. I kind of expected more out of that one. 
I think too with um, Colorado with all of the hiking trails and you know the recreational trails and it, you know seeing mountain bikers and hikers um, I think they get used to seeing people and so they're so conditioned to that people don't present a threat I think you know I've heard that so much on a lot of goat hunts to be honest but Colorado especially that um, you know the goats are just so used to people that it almost becomes an anticlimactic hunt you know, I think it's one of those things as a non-resident, if, you know, getting a go to something, you know, that you want to do, you have to continue to apply for it. Um, but it's never been something that I've really focused a lot of time on. I know that, you know, I did go to Alaska and went on a goat hunt with my hunting partner, um, and he was able to get a goat. I did not. Um, and I know people just love goat hunting. So, I, you know, I think, I think they are one of those unique animals that, you know, they get under your skin and want to chase them around. They they become uh, something that you have a passion for. Um, but you know, in all the hiking that I do in Colorado, just around the Roaring Fork Valley and the Valley and Range and stuff, just you see them a lot. Um, it's it's almost one of those animals that I I just don't even feel the passion to want to go chase them and hunt them. Be you're just saying. I mean, I've heard of guys going on goat hunts and they spend, you know, two months getting prepared for the goat hunt and getting all gear dialed in and they're hiking up the mountain to go set up their and literally there's a goat standing right outside their camp. They don't even get their camp set up and they shoot their goat, that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, it, I, and there's, as you know, Brady, there's a lot of situations where goats are super skittish and wild as well. Uh, for me, goat hunting has never been one of those things I've been super passionate about. I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. You know, of all the of all the elusive tags that are in Colorado, you know, I think the goat is probably of the big three. You know, the goo, the goat, the sheep, and the moose. I think goat is probably number three on my list. It's definitely something I want to attack, just being in my home state and having the opportunity. But with some of the rams that we have here in the in the sheep species. Um, you know, the desert bighorn making a comeback on the western slope, um, and, and then all over the, you know, the central or the continental divide, some of the, some of the sheep that are up there, and some of the moose that I've encountered, I think, I think like, kind of like you, the goat will probably be on the tail end of that list. Um, it's something I'm going to have to take, take seriously before too long, you know, before you get to that age where you don't want to be walking that type of terrain, but of the big three, I think that's sitting at around number three for me. Yeah. Um, speaking of moose, do you have much moose experience? You know, I've done a lot of scouting for guys with moose. Um, there was a local guy here that, uh, through a friend of a friend, he ended up acquiring the, the governor's tag, and I believe it was 2012. And I had scouted out a, a couple of really, really good moose for him, sent him some information on it. And uh, right before he was to go in for the governor's tag, he ended up locating a different moose up over there near Guinella, and uh, and ended up going up there and just off first pictures I'll, I'll have to send you pictures but just looking at him from pictures you would have you would bet your house that he didn't shoot it in Colorado so there's some really really nice moose I have a lot of fun with them in the summertime because where um where I where I spend most of my time chasing elk out and, and scouting for elk and alpine mule deer in the summer there's always a lot of a lot of moose in that that higher country and so getting the chance to look over a lot of moose um, kind of judge class and, and character to them. Uh, you know, there's there's some quality moose here in Colorado. As far as being behind the gun or being behind the bow, chasing them myself, I don't have a lot of experience, but I, I, I do have quite an extensive time watching them and looking them over and gauging habits and stuff like that. Fun stuff. Um, all right, let's dive into, let's start with mule deer um, and talk about um, specifically, you know, Colorado a lot of people ask if there's over-the-counter deer tags in Colorado. I get that question a lot. Um, can you explain a little bit how the deer works in Colorado, uh, the mule deer hunting with the draw, and, and answer the OTC question? You know, the OTC thing, for, the, for a long time, you could get deer tags fairly easily, but within the last five years, uh, they've made it to where deer has kind of been a priority, and everything's on a draw basis. You know, there are options out there for the season's choice tags where you have let's say from October 1st till January 31st to get it done and those are a C list tag so even if you draw a buck tag or even if you're putting in for points those season choice tags are a really good option for you to get your hands on 
Um, it gives you the opportunity to pursue them. You may not be chasing a, a you know a, a tremendous buck, but it gives you an opportunity to get out there without burning points, and it's the closest thing you're going to find to an over the counter. Um, there's so, there's a lot of quality areas where you can do so, whether it be in the mountains or on the plains. Um, there's a, there's a ton of opportunity to still get in the deer game without spending all your points and without without burning your points just for an average tag. But Colorado seems to be pretty focused on keeping those meal deer under wraps um, and managed a little bit better than they had. Unfortunately, th throughout the state and a lot of the areas that I, I like to chase the mule deer during the later seasons during the rut, um, you're starting to see a decline, you know, where units where you'd see more. In numbers or quality? Or? Both, actually. Um, okay. You know, within the last 10 years, 10 years ago you could go into a sage valley in – you know, Grand Valley or the Summit Valley. And, you know, when the deer herds were there, you'd see groups of does 20, 30, 40 at a time, a couple bucks mixed in. And the last couple of years, I'd say over the last five years, you're only seeing, you know, four groups of four or five does, maybe one quality buck. Um, some of the units that were really, relatively unknown, or I don't want to say unknown, but underrated it's becoming even hard to find a 180 class deer in some of those units anymore. Whereas you could go out during fourth season elk tag and while you're waiting for the elk, you could glass up multiple deer over the, you know, the 170 class in the same valley. And it's just, it's just not so much like that anymore. And, you know, I know lions, the lions are making a big, a big push in Colorado. The bears there's, you know, they implemented that change where a lot of the units now you can get an over the counter bear tag with your elk tag or your deer tag. Um, and I don't know if it's predation or what, or I, I don't want to say it's over hunting because everything's on a draw basis, but it's, what about the numbers are kind of factored in there? You know, honestly, we haven't had extreme, extreme winters for a few years now. So I'm sure there's, there's still quite a few that, that don't make it, but, uh, you know, a lot of these deer cover 40, 50, 60 miles sometimes just going from their summer range to their winter range. And there's a lot of these lower valleys and a lot of these ranches are throwing feed out and, and supplying feed and everything and protection uh, for these deer, but you're just not seeing the numbers anymore. And it's, it's not necessarily from over hunting. Cause like I said, everything's on a draw basis, but it's deer is getting, the deer is going in the opposite direction of where you'd imagine it to after putting everything into the draw cycle. Now, Colorado offers um, archery opportunities, muzzleloader, and then you've got your rifle seasons. You basically have your second season, your third season, and your fourth season. Um, one of the things that a lot of people are kind of up in arms, if you will, there's, there, it's, there's two different camps. There's the guys that are kind of up in arms that the season day this year and especially next year are so late. Um, pushing these third and fourth seasons way, way late into November, which is going to make incredible hunting for the people that draw those tags but their argument is the fact that those bucks uh, are going to be in essence sitting ducks out there in the in the open in the in the on the winter range and potentially it's going to be a bloodbath for big mature bucks and then you've got another group that you know they've been sitting on a bunch of points and all they want to do is just shoot a big buck and and so you've kind of got two differing opinions colliding, but the reality is we are faced with, you know, this year and next year, next year for sure being dates super late, like Thanksgiving type dates um, for those four season. I, I'm just wondering as a Colorado resident, your thoughts on the, the season structure and will it will create a phenomenal deer hunt this year and next um, the impact that that might have on some of you, your, you know, Colorado's big deer. You know, it's it, like you said, there's two sides to the fence. Personally, I'm, I'm still, I, I'm still stacking a handful of points. Uh, you know, I'm in that seven, seven points class and it's, I don't want to say it's necessarily a bloodbath, but I, I think, you know, for the guys that do draw that tag, they've got a real, they've got a real opportunity um, at a trophy class meal deer, the guys that have been drawing those later season tags, the the third and the fourth season guys, you know, as early as the seasons were, I wasn't seeing the mature bucks move into the valleys until the week after the fourth season. Uh, two years in a row now, um, I've had my eye on this deer that last year he probably would go 210, and he moved in like clockwork the week after fourth season ended, 
and just got to watch him all winter long. Same thing, exact, almost to the day this year. He moved in a uh, week after fourth season. So it, it's a give and take because a lot of the guys that do draw that tag, they go into those units chasing those, those mature bucks. And as early as the seasons were, those bucks aren't there yet. So it's, it's making it tempting for those guys to take a, a younger class deer out of their herd. Whereas if it moves that season a, a week back, and it gives those guys that, that spend the points and draw those tags an opportunity to go pursue what they're actually really after. It's going to let a lot of those younger class bucks mature because they're all coming from relatively the same gene pool. You know, if you're in one valley and you're focused on one hunting one deer and you go in chasing one deer and you end up shooting a three-year-old because your big deer didn't present himself, there's a chance that that three-year-old deer that you took came out of the gene pool from the buck that you were actually after and in a couple of years, he'll become that trophy class. So, is that's very good. As bad as it is that, as bad as it is that some of the bigger deer are going to get taken out with these later seasons, it's giving those younger class deer and more of the getting away from that feast or famine um, mentality to where you know I have to go in and I take this deer because if, if I don't, somebody else is going to. It's just going to it's going to get guys to stay more focused on the task that they're trying to, to harvest a, a mature deer, and it's going to give them, that, give them that opportunity to do so and let some of those younger class bucks grow into maturity. Yeah, that's a very good point. I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective. Um, one of the other things I want to talk to you about is you've got archery opportunities and muzzleloader opportunities, you know, in, in August and September and then you've got, you know, your, your rifle deer hunts that are, you know, October, November. And one of the things that people have to understand is sometimes the great deer units that you hear about in October and November are not necessarily the great deer units that you hear about, let's call it, in the velvet season. So the high country, there's, there's kind of a, you have to understand that Yes, some of the units have high country and winter range, and the, it makes the whole unit very good. But there are some other units where it might not, it may be great high country hunting, uh, velvet type hunting, you know, time frame, but then all of a sudden those deer start to migrate and there's not very much public land and they end up, those same d big giant deer end up on private land and you can't get a shot at them. Whereas then there's places and units that are not great high country, you know, not, not the just top of the line high country hunts, but then have a little bit more country winter range type country or transitional country where once those later seasons start, those deer start showing up. Talk about that a little bit and if there's any units specifically that kind of jump out in your mind that, you know, people historically say, oh, that's a great deer unit, and you say, yeah, it's great in the high country, but it's not a great late season or vice versa. Definitely. So, you know, some of the areas that are, are really quality for the early season, uh, you know, that archery, that alpine season, are going to be along the Continental Divide. Um, you know, Summit County offers some great opportunities for alpine deer. Um, you know, Winter Park area offers some great opportunities for alpine deer. Um, you know, the Rabbit Ears Range offers some, some quality opportunity for high, for, you know, high alpine deer. But sometimes, you know, like in, in the Winter Park area, a lot of that lower valley, the Grand Valley, is private. Um, and so what you're catching, that was one of those units that I was referring to, you know, you could catch those bucks in velvet up on the Alpine on the Divide and then come fourth season, they're 55 miles away on the other side of the county, down in the low grounds, you know, living in the river bottoms and, and feeding on the, on, the, on the hay fields that are down there on the river for sanctuary. Um, so sometimes, you know, those... It, it, it all kind of comes down to where you prefer to shoot your animal, in my opinion. If you if you want the opportunity to chase one of those deer um, in the alpine, then you need to focus on, on the continental divide, somewhere that's going to have higher areas, whereas you go to the northwest corner of the state, um, you know, 21, units 21, 22, 10, a lot of that doesn't have necessarily alpine terrain, and those deer kind of fluctuate. It's all rolling hills um, of sage and sage canyons, box canyons, stuff like that to where those units are going to be fairly similar year round and you're going to be able to find those animals in the same units just in different portions of the unit um, for majority of the year. You know, unit 10 is a, a really unique unit just, you know, kind of like the elk. Um, if you've got the points to, to throw at it for deer, 
you know, the numbers, the numbers that you're going to see aren't necessarily there, but the animals that you see are all going to be pretty quality. They're all going to be, I don't want to say all, but majority of the deer that you're after are going to be in that upper 180 and, you know, mid 180s and up class. There's some really quality deer there, and they, they don't really have to go anywhere because there's not alpine terrain where snow is pushing them out. Whereas, you know, over in the Grand Valley, you can catch them up during the last weeks of August and first couple weeks of September up in the alpine. And then you're, there's so much timber between there and their wintering grounds that you're essentially looking for a needle in the haystack. Um, so anybody that's really wanting to focus on mule deer, it, I, I, I take, tell you to take a good look at yourself and evaluate in your head that perfect scenario of where you imagine yourself shooting one and where your heart chases you or takes you to and then start pursuing your tags from there. Um, with with the season getting moved back, I'll be really curious to see this year how many velvet deer are taken out um, out of that alpine because you, it's such a small window between when those deer go, you know, from, from soft horn to hard horn and notoriously over the last couple of years by the second week of archery season, second, third week, you're already getting bucks that are peeled off. And I know there's a handful of guys in, you know, here in the state that, watch the deer one night and put them to bed essentially or watch them until the sun went down and came back in the next morning and found the exact same deer that they were watching the night before and he'd completely rubbed off overnight and they, you know, saw him in velvet and the next day they shot him and he was hard horned. Um, so it's, you know, you, you do have a lot of different units where they do have that transition, but it's, it's really tough alpine to the wintering grounds because there's so much timber in between that you can lose them in lose track of them, and, and, you know, deer are so nomadic that they cover so much country. Um, but if, if you're chasing a deer that you want to stay in the same relative terrain most of the time, the, you know, the western slope tags are, are, are fairly, fairly, what's the word I want to use? They're, they're conducive for that because those deer stay in the same terrain almost year-round, and then once, once the rut kicks off, they'll separate Box Canyon to, you know, to one direction, but it's all, all relative terrain. Yeah, you know, that makes sense. Um, when it comes to, you know, late season deer, um, you know, you, you hear about a lot of the units, 44, 55, 67, 66, 54, you know, a lot of that um, uh, Gunnison Basin, Gunnison Valley area. Um, what are some areas that you would say, any other units as far as those third and fourth seasons that you would say are just prime, prime, you know, third and fourth season tags? Um, some of the valley tag, you know, going from, from Silverthorne up to Kremling, um, that Highway 9 corridor offers some incredible late season deer hunting. I've seen multiple really, really high quality deer come out of there um, between Kremling and, and, you know, Rabbit Ears Pass. All that stuff, it transitions from timber into the sage. Anywhere you're going to get that type of terrain. It seems like the later seasons where I've seen the bigger deer get taken out of for some of the lower areas, some of the some of the boxier canyons, um, steeper canyons, and those sage flats. Um, there's there's been some really quality deer taken out in, in areas that you you would, it almost kind of baffle you when those deer actually commit to moving in. They actually move in, but uh, some quality and you know along that Highway Nine corridor, there's a ton of public land, walk-in access, um, state you know state ground that offer some really quality opportunities right off the highway, and you can go for days and days before you hit a private boundary. Um, once you get over off, you know, to the, to the east of Kremlin, into the Grand Valley, a lot of that stuff, the higher country where the deer are coming from is public, but it's such a difficult task to get around the private boundaries to get up to the public stuff. By the time you get there, there's a good chance that the deer are going to be down on the private sectors, and all you're left to do is sit and kind of watch and observe. Um, but it's, in my recommendation, anywhere that, that timber rolls into the sage and there's some, spot, you know, scattered cover from here to there, uh, it, that's, that's where I've seen majority of the big deer over the last couple of years get, get pulled out of, or I've seen quite, quite a few get pulled out of. I don't want to say that's where they all are, but if I, if I was a betting man and I was stacking points trying to get into something that was a realistic hunt, those are some of the areas that I'd be focused on. I know, you know, a really good buddy of mine uh, pulled a, a pretty good deer out of, out of 44 a couple of years ago, um, 54 up there in the Gunnison Valley. Uh, I know they had a decent winter kill a few years ago, um, like in the 2009-2010 range. 
Um, but everything that I've heard is a lot of those deer are making a comeback right now. Right on. Let's jump over and talk about yep. elk, which is something we're passionate about. Um, and talk about, first and foremost, let's talk about some of these OTC units uh, because I think everybody out there, you know, wants to experience Colorado elk hunting. It's legendary elk hunting. And I try and tell people sometimes, you know, yes, there can be some great hunting if, if you kind of know what you're doing and where you're going, but know that, it, you know, it can be hit or miss. Um, but, you know, I mean, do you think it's the good old days right now, or do you think the good old days have passed by a little bit for o OTC um, archery elk hunting? OTC archery, I think, it, it, I think the good old days are behind us. Um, you know, it seems like the the division they they do their best, but a lot of times they're by allowing the over the counter units and majority of the, the units in Colorado being over the counter, it adds a lot of pressure, and it's not necessarily a good thing, but it's not a bad thing. You know, the pressure keeps the elk moving. But if there's too much pressure, it you know, like in, in last year's scenario, majority of the elk on on the one front that I hunt uh, are the one front that I spent a lot of time on last year. By the second week between the pressure and a fire, I mean, almost every elk that was in the valley was already down on private sectors. And it was, you know, the, the private public boundary, you had guys lined up every 50, 100 yards across there and every one of them blowing on a call trying to entice a bull to come off the private. And it just, it, it created an awkward scenario. And, you know, in that scenario, you're towing lines where, depending if you know the ranch where you're sitting on the fence line or, or the property lineup, it's one thing to get a bull to come up to you and commit to you. But after you make the shot, chances are, especially with, an, you know, archery over the counter, he's going to turn around and seek refuge back down to where he just came from. And you have the opportunity to lose him on the run uh, if he gets across that property line. And then you've got to go through the hassle of, you know, knocking on the door and, and explaining the scenario. Um, but there's still, a, you know, from what I can tell is a lot, of the, a lot of the pressure that comes is along the continental divide. You know, everybody wants really quality hunting, but they don't want necessarily want to have to drive five, six hours just to get to it. So you see a lot of the pressure starts. The farther west you go, the more the pressure is going to die off. A lot of those western, those western units that are over the counter offer incredible animals. Um, incredible opportunity, but uh, it's it's definitely the game. The game has definitely changed, and a lot of the pressure from the over-the-counter units has has created an awkward scenario. And I don't think necessarily the hunters have it figured out, and I don't know if the division necessarily has it figured out either. Um, the best way to to combat and, and to please both sides. What would you say on that archery elk hunt, um, the OTC? I know you've hunted it a lot and been around it your whole life there, what would you say, you know, people were always asking, you know, is it good to go the first week or is it good to go the last week? And, you know, I always laugh and say, why don't you go in the middle? And, you know, they're like, you're just dodging my question. When's, when's the best time to go? What would you say for an O in asking the question? I know it's pretty intricate because there's differences in each part of the season, but if you, if you only had seven to ten days to go and you're giving someone advice, what would you say is the best seven to ten day window historically on a, on a calendar? Uh, in my breakdown, if you've had the time to spend all summer watching a certain range that you're trying to go into and hunt, if you can pick and you can find a nomadic bull, as you know, I mean, bulls go nomadic through the summer or they'll be in smaller bachelor groups. If you can find a bull and you can locate him more than once on more than one trip, say you go in four times and you can locate the bull twice, or you go in five times, you can locate the bull three times, and you feel like there's a chance that you can sneak in underneath the bull and catch him as he's coming back back down into the timber to seek, you know, for his daily bedding, that opening weekend or that first two weeks is a quality time. But once those bulls start to uh, start to get the feeling and they start going, you know, rounding up cows and going on the seeking phase. In my opinion, that's your best opportunity. If, if you're newer to hunting and you don't feel like you have full confidence in, in what you're doing with elk or your calling approach, the seeking phase is a, a really quality time because they, don't have, they haven't established their herds, they haven't established their harems, 
they're more responsive to calls as they're coming in and starting to gather cows or seeking cows and they hear a chirp, they're going to come investigate. They're going to give you an opportunity or give you a look over because everybody's, you know, all the bulls are, are doing the same thing. And the sooner they can start rounding, you know, cows up, the better opportunity they're going to have for a larger harem and a better opportunity to breed. Um, personally, my favorite is that middle to the last. Um, typically, I'll go in for, you know, seven to eight days and, and stay out from, you know, the whole time. Um, that's my favorite time. You know, the, the animals are more vocal. Uh, they're, they're moving more. Um, there's more challenges. There's more, I don't want to say, I guess I could say there's more fighting, um, more battles for, for dominance. And so I, I like chasing elk on the run and gun. And they'll be that way pretty much through the end of September. Sometimes you'll see a fall off in the rut activity towards that last week. It'll start to dwindle just a tad. But in my experience, unless you've got some time all summer to spend watching animals and, and looking at different ranges and trying to locate the same bull or, or different bulls on more than one occasion, um, you're, you're essentially just hiking in the heat and, and chasing a needle in a haystack. Um, that seeking phase is a really quality opportunity for to catch an animal and to really establish what you're calling and, and how your calling techniques kind of come together. Um, but once they get grouped up, it becomes more of a challenge, but you have more opportunity. You're not checking drainage by drainage, looking for one bull at a time. Usually when you find them that middle to late half, there's, you know, two or three different herds in the same drainage. If it's, if it's a big enough drainage or, you know, drainage by drainage, you'll have a herd in each drainage. And so there's, there's more opportunity because there's more elk concentrated. Um, so personally, I like the middle half, like dead middle towards the tail end uh, would be if, if you've been at it for a while and you know exactly, you know, you're confident in your calling and you're confident in your approach, playing the wind right, I, I think you have a really good opportunity later um, just because the elk are more concentrated down in the breeding grounds and the rut grounds. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I personally like the middle to late half. Okay. Uh, as far as limited, um, you know, the, the draw units, you know, you hear about 76, you know, down south of Lake City. You hear about uh, 61 up on the Uncompahgre Plateau. Uh, you know, I, I hear stuff about those two units. What are some other units that you would say? I mean, I hear stuff about Unit 40. Um, what would you say are quality archery elk um, units? You know, what would you say your top five units would be in the state of Colorado for quality? Total quality hunt and quality bulls. Definitely. And then you've got um, your twos and your tens and your... Definitely. Uh, you know, 76 is a really good unit. 61 uh, over the last couple of years, or I'd say over the last 10 years, has made an extremely strong, you know, movement towards the quality class of bulls. Um, if I had to take my pick right now, I, I would probably chase 61 above all else. Two, Even 10, over the two, two and, and the tens? Up in the northwest corner? Yeah, you know, at 2 and 10, it's a phenomenal area to hunt. But the numbers, you know, sometimes there's guys that go into, you know, 210 or 201 and spend an entire week, and they might see five elk. Um, a lot of that ground is private up there. And it's not to say that you can't do it. A guy, a guy that I've worked with for a long time, a, a dear friend of mine, got the phone call a couple of years ago that somebody had turned in a, a unit 10 tag and he was the first one on the, on the board and he, he chose to go in there by himself with his mules and looked over animals, you know, didn't see a ton, looked over quality animals and ended up coming home with like a 354. Whereas, you know, 15 years ago, if the saying was, if you came home with less than a 360 out of the, one of those three units that you settled, um, right. You know, it, 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 it's a different approach now. Two is a lot of public ground. Ten is a lot of public ground. And, and 201 has a lot of public ground. But getting the access to the public stuff can be tricky from time to time. Um, gotcha. 61, there's just so much ground in 61. And it seems like more and more every year there's, there's really quality bulls coming out of there. Um, even on the 62 side, um, you know, it's, they get moved over into 62. But 61 has in my opinion, has established itself every bit as good as the 210 and 201s. Um, just off of the quality animals that have came out, a really good buddy of mine hunted it a couple years ago, Black Powder, and 
was walking by six points to go pursue bigger six points. Um, saw the, a seven by that was an absolute stinger of a bull and had the smallest group in the entire in the entire valley. He had two cows with him, two three cows with him. Whereas other, you know, you'd see other other six by sixes with thirty forty cows at a time. Um, so just just seeing numbers of game, accessible territory, um, accessible ground, quality of animals. I, I think sixty one is has kind of established itself. You know, it doesn't come without a cost because it does take quite a few points. I believe um, Brian, my buddy, either spent fifteen or sixteen points to get that black powder tag. Um, so it, it's kind of the point creep's kind of getting up there to where it, it, it's going to be a lot like a 210 and a 201 uh, in, in a matter of time. And, you know, the interesting thing about 2 and 10 and all that stuff up there, the only thing that separates the trophy units of, of 10 and, and, you know, say the over-the-counter units is, is a river, and the river is 20 yards wide and maybe a foot and a half deep. And that's the only thing separating those units. And I, I personally watched really quality bulls come off the public side that just slipped across the river, were feeding on a hay field or, you know, just on, on the wander and ended up on the wrong side of the river and, and got taken. So I, it's not out of question to, to hunt those units that are bordering some of those proper, some of those trophy units up there if you're an over-the-counter guy and you don't have the points to spend. There's also over-the-counter, you know, we're talking archery, a lot of archery stuff. Um, also over-the-counter rifles. Talk about some of those hunts and logistics and, um, you know, what guys should expect on those over-the-counter rifle hunts. You know, some of those, uh, some of those third, those third season over-the-counter uh, tags can be really quality. Um, in my experience in the last couple of years, just, Getting you can get an over-the-counter either sex tag for some of those for some of those units or a statewide bull tag, and there's there's definitely some quality to be had there. There's some big animals, and in that time, you may, you may not unless you unless you're hunting the post rut areas where those bulls are seeking sanctuary and kind of bacheloring back up, you still got a really good quality opportunity at a at a at a good five point, sometimes smaller six points, because they're gonna if they're not the dominant bull, they're gonna they're not going to go nomadic. They're not going to go to the post rut zones. They, you know, they got kicked out of the herd through the rut phase, and all they all they seem to want to do is get back to comfort with numbers. And so, on multiple of these late season hunts, the thirds and the fourth, um, I, I've seen quality bulls in with the big the big wads of cows. And so, there's a lot of opportunity, you know, especially the later you go. And there's like the, you some of the, the, the best. Say that one more time. Seems like the fourth season can be the best. And, 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 and I will, you know, I hunt the fourth season every year, and I have a lot of fun with it. You you see a lot of animals. You get a lot of opportunity at animals. Um, you can kind of have your pick if you're willing to do the work. Sometimes it can be, you know, a, a treacherous hunt. Sometimes you're post-holing thigh deep in snow, um, getting through the drainages, getting to the higher ele elevations or the lookout points. But there's a lot of opportunity there, and you know you can if, if you say you want to do a archery hunt and you want to chase a bull with a rifle, you know pull a B season or a B list cow tag and, and just hunt cows with your bow and leave that opportunity to pull your A tag for an either sex third or a fourth season tag. You have that opportunity, and, and there's definitely quality there. Um, and I, it gives I, you I, the I, opportunity I mean, to learn units as well. I mean, you can be hunting those B you know, B-list cow tags and learning units where then you can then figure out where you want to be, right? Absolutely, you know, and if you're hunting the same unit, say you're chasing cows with your bow in the early season, you see where the elk are at during, you know, the early fall months, and then you go back in the same unit and you can find those elk in their wintering grounds and you kind of you can kind of establish their traveling routes and it, it prepares you for the upcoming year. You know, I've seen, I've seen a, a lot of elk up here during the archery season. Now this group of elk is down, you know, down in the flats, two drainages away, and you can kind of map out the course. And by doing so, you've got to, you know, if you're doing systematically, elk are here early, they're here late, so they're realistically probably rutting somewhere in between. If I can find the drainages or the travel corridors that they're moving in between, Maybe next year I get that A-list archery tag and I try and kill a bull with my archery tag, knowing the travel routes, knowing where they start and where they end up for the year, and finding yourself in between 
um, and establishing yeah their travel corridors. It, it puts you in a really good position to scout, learn units, learn the learn the travel corridors, learn what the elk are seeking at that time of the year, whether it be food or water or shelter, um, anything in between. So I, I I fully there's been multiple years where I've I you know chased just cows with my bow just just to have the opportunity later at a bull. Um, and vice versa, you know, me personally, I, I've always been in the theory or for the majority of my life, I've been in the theory, I'm going to chase bulls with my bow so I can be with them whenever they're, they're, they're talking and they're vocal. And then if it comes together, then fantastic. But if not, I've always got a, a second chance to come back whenever the odds are a little bit more in my favor to hunt with a rifle and chasing a cow during the later season. Um, just, just to learn units, just to learn elk behavior, their travel corridors and, and kind of what they're seeking at that time of year. Good. Um, we've got a bunch of Q&A that I want to cover here. Before I do that, I want to thank all of the listeners of this podcast. Uh, you guys have been an unbelievable uh, loyal group uh, for, you know, since 2015 of February. Um, just awesome. thank you guys for all that you do. Thanks for all the Instagram messages that you get. I just appreciate all of the loyal support. I want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank Go Hunt Insider right now. It's application season. We're talking about all these western states. Uh, Go Hunt has the best draw odds, harvest statistics, strategy articles, the best resource for trying to check out each unit per animal per state. Uh, go to the uh, J, uh, let's see, gohunt.com forward slash jscott. That's going to get you a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card just for signing up. Uh, I also want to thank Go Hunt optics department my friend Cody Nelson you've heard him on this podcast a bunch he's the optics manager if you guys have any uh, optics needs at all whether it be binos spotting scopes rifle scopes range finders anything to do with glassing tripods uh, give him a call you can reach him at 702-847-8747 that's extension 2 you can also send him a text or a call on his cell phone that's 602-399-3699 I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Kuyu is the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. I've been wearing it since uh, the l later part of 2010. Uh, go to Kuyu.com. That's K-U-I-U.com. It's a direct-to-consumer model. You can order everything right off of the website. There are no retail locations. Uh, you often, if you listen to this podcast, you hear me talk with uh, the Kuyu guys. I do a Q&A with Brendan Burns. Uh, and I just thank Kuyu for their support. I want to thank Onyx Maps. If you use the JScott20 promo code at onyxmaps.com, you're going to get a 20% discount. I want to thank Clonescope.com. Use the JScott20 uh, promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount. And Apex Ammunition. Go to uh, apexmunition.com. Uh, and I really appreciate Apex stepping up and sponsoring the podcast as well. That is the shot that I'm going to be using for the upcoming turkey season. Um, Brady, let's dive in. I know your time is limited. Let's just dive in and, and try and cover as many of these questions as we can. Um, so let's see here. Uh, guys wanting to know, talk about Unit 33 mule deer. Seems like it's going downhill. Um, I don't have any experience in 33. Do you, Brady? I don't. Um, I'm kind of looking at it right now to see, you know, 33 is fairly close to the 44 corridor, and a lot of 33, it looks like, you know, you're going to be in that Glenwood Canyon area, um, which could be obviously steep on both sides. Um, let's see here. Car, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, you're, 33 is right on the, right on the edge of, of where you're at, typically a little bit west of you between you and, and Rio Blanco County um, up there in Carbondale. It, it, it's deep country. It's, you know, there's a lot of cover in there. It's a lot of ground to cover. I know my dad's guys hunted that for a while for elk, and even some of the guys that would pull deer tags uh, to chase, just to have a deer tag in their pocket while they were chasing elk, it all kind of echo the same sound, that it is on the decline. Um, it's, hopefully it's not like that forever, you know. Hopefully we can get this whole thing under, under wrap um, and, and start learning how, to manage or better manage these these animals, I I do know it's a ton of public ground, um, it, it so it, it you know chasing them when they're most vulnerable would be my best bet. If you're still adamant on chasing 33 or that 33 tag, you, it, it's playing the numbers game. You know 
you're going to see the bigger, the earlier you hunt it, the less deer you're going to see because there's going to be so much ground in between each deer, whereas later in November, you're going to find those deer starting to group up, starting to, you know, starting to rut. Um, so it, it is on the decline from my knowledge, uh, which is not a ton, but it's, it's still doable if, if, you can, if you can really focus on trying to hunt them whenever the odds are stacked more so in your favor. Here's a question. It says Colorado preference points now, and then there's three money signs. Now money. I have three points. Is it is it worth it to continue building? I mean, the answer to that, from, and I'll let you answer too, Brady, but if this is something that's a priority to you and it's important to you, then absolutely you, you've got to keep applying. If, if you quit, then you're basically out of Colorado or you have to be, you know, be subject to um, the over-the-counter elk uh, hunt, but yeah, I mean, there's still some tags I would continue to apply if he's got three points. What do you think? No, I I think stacking points is always it, it's always a good thing. I, there's not a year that would go by whether I had a broken leg or you know whatever the case may be. I I'm always going to stack points. It it does cost money now, but if you remember previously before the implement or before the changes two years ago just to apply for sheep, goat, and moose, you were spending, you know, what, $200 for an application, and you were out that money for, for the 30 days until you got your refund. Um, and now I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's only $15. Um, so I, you know, I would absolutely recommend always stacking points. You never know when you're going to want to come back. If you've got little ones that are up and coming and who's to say that you can't you can't gauge right now if in 15, 20 years they're going to really want to come out and have the opportunity to chase a quality bull or a quality deer. Um, you know, it it gives it so much opportunity, and you wouldn't want to be starting over, say, you know, you have a little boy that turns 17 or 18, and all he wants to do is go on a, a really quality elk hunt with his dad or his mom, and you, you go to apply and you're, you know, you're starting over from scratch. Whereas if you're stacking those points and the opportunity comes around, you you have the opportunity to jump on it. Whereas starting the starting the count over when your when your kids are old enough, or say you you know you your hunting partner's kind of fallen off and you don't really have anybody to hunt with, you know say you ten fifteen years down the road you meet a hunting partner that you all you want to do is hunt with and just have a, enjoy your time. You don't want to be starting over at that point again there either. I I highly recommend it. And even while you're stacking points, Colorado's a you know, it's one of those states, is, it's an opportunity state, whereas even if you are stacking point now, you can still, you can still pull a tag. You know, there, there's the opportunity on the application where you put the point, the point preference first and then, and then chase the tag left over from there. Um, so you can still stack points while you're hunting, and even if you're not hunting and you're taking some time off, you know, you, you can draw some of those second season tags. Years. Yeah, exactly, um, and, you know, you're not going to want to start over in 15 years. Another question here, what kind of country are most likely to find bears in high or low elevation? You know, my experience with bears in Colorado is they're just exponentially multiplying. It seems like bears are thick. Everywhere I go, there's bears. Um, but, you know, I find anywhere you find a lot of good oak brush, you find a lot of bears. Um, Brady, do you have some experience with, with bears and, and answering this question? Definitely, definitely. You know, I've very rarely have I seen bears in in the higher the higher elevation. Um, typically, the bears that I I come across are are below ten thousand yeah. feet. Yeah. Um, yeah, the ten thousand and a lot of the, you know, like you said, the bears are multiplying like crazy. Uh, they call it a division wildlife or parks and wildlife wouldn't be offering an over the counter tag to pair up with your elk or your deer tag if we weren't extremely high in numbers. Notoriously, the last couple of years when the when the bear tags come out and a lot of the units that I hunt, even, you know, whenever you, if you're the first one in line, by the time they punch in your numbers, the, the bear tags are already sold out. Um, you know, so with putting them back into the over-the-counter type scenario, it, it, it's kind of explaining that we do have bears multiplying anywhere, you know, that south half of the state, Walsenburg, Pueblo, um, stuff down there where you're getting, you know, La Vida area where you're getting those transitions and heavy oak brush areas or, you know, steamboat, um, down to the southwest between Steamboat and, and uh, McCoy, some of that country, you're going to find a lot of bears in, in the thick brush and the, and the drainages, um, you know, and even more so down in town. A lot, of the, a lot of the Grand Valley now, a lot of the bears are being taken 
you know, coming back up into the hills after they're rummaging through the neighborhoods or going through the restaurant dumpsters, and then they're just jumping off the road and, and climbing the hill, and a lot of those bears are getting taken off of lower elevations. So for chasing bears, I'd say mid-level, you know, 10,000 feet at the high end, all the way down to the valley floor. Um, if you've got, you know, good raspberry patches, if you find a big a big meadow of, of raspberry bushes, there's a chance you could put a camera on that on that meadow and, and watch multiple bears come in there and feed in the mornings and in the afternoons. Um, if you've got a water hole, I've got a couple of buddies that, that hang tree stands over water holes, and after they chase elk and deer in the morning, they'll go sit on the water hole midday uh, and hoping for a bear to come through. Um, the Western Slope's got a ton of bears. That Unit 61 that we discussed about trophy elk, there is a ton of bears in that. Um, my buddy who shot that that bull over there in 2014, I think on the first on the first leg of carrying quarters back out, uh, he came back and there was six or seven bears within 100 yards of the carcass, trying to get to his bull. So I mean, there is there is a ton of bears, but you don't and you don't necessarily have to stay high to hunt them. You know, mid range and down is would be my highest recommendation, or, or thick thick country like oak brush. Got a question here. Is it possible to hold a deer and elk tag for the same dates in the unit? The answer is yes. I know there are units where you can have both, but Brady, I'll let you give specifics if you know of it. Yeah, um, it, it's definitely possible. On multiple occasions, I've had an elk tag and a deer tag. The hardest part for me is I, I, I try to stick to or stay disciplined enough to pursue quality or trophy, and I don't want to say trophy, but mature game, um, kind of going back to earlier, letting things grow to maturity. Um, and with the seasons being, you know, week long or shorter in Colorado, unless you've got your area scouted out really good and, and think you can get in and get one or the other on the ground within the first two days and have the rest of the hunt spend on the other, it's a difficult task because for me personally, if I go in for six days, it usually takes me a day or two to find the elk, a day or two to, to kind of put a pattern to it and get one on the ground, and then a day or two to get it out. Um, and that, that kind of encompasses your whole season. So it's, it's possible, but in my recommendation, I'd, I'd separate the two so you have more quality time to pursue one than the other rather than just throwing it in together. A lot of times you won't find those animals in the same areas or the same sanctuaries. And there's times you'll find them feeding in the same areas, but... Um, you're not, you know, not necessarily going to find a, a 180 class deer and a 300 class bull feeding in the same valley. It, I'm sure it happens regularly, but um, on most over-the-counter or public units, um, it it can be a trick to find a quality of each animal or a quality of each species to to take out and have the time to hunt both at one time. Good stuff. Uh, let's see, uh, tips for early season mule deer. That's kind of right up your alley. The higher, the better. Um, you know those those big those big upper upper basin parks or the alpine parks. Um, that's that's where I I spend a lot of my time in the summer, uh, getting as high as I can, whether it be on a four wheeler or in a truck, and then hiking from there to the very top, and overlooking large basins. You know if you're if you're in a basin that at the head of it where you can be two miles wide. Uh, there's there's a good chance in the early season that you're going to find multiple deer that you'd be willing to take all within the same drainage. And that's, in my opinion, if you're chasing quality, mature deer, that's your best opportunity to find more than one or more than that needle in a haystack because you'll find two or three. Um, if anybody follows Aaron Snyder with Kafaru, um, he's notorious for documenting his alpine mule deer hunts and, and having multiple opportunities on, on you know, in an eight-day period. He's, he's realistically putting two to three stalks a morning um, on some of these high alpine mule deer. So the higher, the better, where you can cover as much country with glass as you can, camp high, stay high, um, play the wind, and, and you'll see a lot of deer feeding out of those open parks. Got a question here. All else being equal, should the fact that the tough rut last year, bad snowstorm combo in 2019 created some holdover bulls, increasing the size expectations for 2020? You know, I with animals shedding every year, it, it's tough to say hold over and what they're gonna what they're gonna grow to be this year. I will say we did we did have quite a bit of, of moisture this year in the high country down in the you know down in town. We didn't necessarily see a very harsh winter, but we did get adequate snowfall in the high country, good snowpack, and so the vegetation is going to be there to fuel the growth. 
And a lot of the, there was a couple of the other ranches around where I hunt during the later season that actually didn't even bring in elk clients for those third or fourth seasons. Um, everybody was kind of geared for the late season mule deer hunt last year. And so a lot of those bigger bulls that made it down into the sanctuaries of the private ground, um, whether they were hunted or not, there's a good chance that there's going to be a lot of mature bulls that survived the winter and that, that will be back to grow this year, whether they have surpassed their their peak and they're going to be on the decline this year and down a few inches or whether they're going to be up a few inches. I mean, we've got all the all the makings between the moisture and, and the lack of pressure or the lack of harvest of quality bulls late, late last year that there's going to be some, there's going to be some good opportunities this year for sure. Yeah. And I know, I mean, even last year over at the ranch where we were, you know, we were expecting, we had such high expectations for antler growth because we had such a rough drought year in 2018, although we had pretty darn good antler growth. Uh, being an Arizona guy, knowing how much drought affects antler growth, I thought last year with being as wet as it was, as much snow as it was, I, I was taught a little bit of a lesson in that. Um, it, we had so much snow last year down at the ranch um, and, and so much, so much snow pack uh, that those elk did not get really, it stayed so cold so late, they really didn't get on green feed. This is my speculation that you know, they really didn't start out, you know, just gangbusters on green feed because they were ha still having to paw through snow to get the feed. Um, and we actually saw antler growth last year where in our area was actually down. You know, our top four or five bulls, all except for one, I would say, had declined and, and were smaller. Um, and the only thing that I can go back to and point out is the fact that they're one year older. Same bulls, you know, we have trail cameras three years in a row of them. Um, you, we know it's the same bull, but I think they started out uh, on, you know, pretty tough times and not on green feed right away, whereas I think on more of an average year where that snow, you know, starts receding and melting and, you know, it, we get a spring green up, uh, you know, I think those elk can immediately get on green feed after they shed their antler. So it's just something to think about. Um, Brady, I know your time is limited. I appreciate you spending uh, time here uh, with us and uh, really look forward to chatting at you again. I'll have to do another rut update or something this September. Uh, and uh, just thank you for coming on and, and sharing with us. I wanted to give you one last chance to add anything that you think you need to uh, or anything you want to say. No, Jay, I really appreciate you having me on uh, amidst all the craziness that's going on. I hope everybody stays uh, happy, healthy, and family stays healthy. But no, I'm, I, I really appreciate the time. I'm, I'm happy to come on any time. It, it might be worth maybe midsummer. I'm sitting over here chomping at the bit uh, with everything, all the craziness going on in town, just to disappear to the woods and, and get, get the scouting season started. Um, so as soon as the snow falls or as soon as the snow melts, um, that, that's going to be my sanctuary to get away from all the people and all the craziness and just kind of try and find some solitude. And if you want, we can catch up maybe midsummer. I'll tell you what I'm seeing for antler growth and, and kind of go from awesome. there. And then we can do another rut update for sure. But, awesome. uh, but no, I really appreciate your time. I hope you stay healthy. Hope you stay safe. Um, and hopefully we can get out of this sooner rather than later. Yeah. And for everyone out there listening, these are tough times, but you know, let's follow the guidelines that we've been given and, uh, let's try and make a run at this virus as, as good as we can and, you know, practice social distancing, keep away from each other. And it's just a good practice. There are people out there that, you know, could, uh, you know, could die from this. Uh, and we want to make sure uh, that even if you're a young, healthy person and, you know, you're not really worried about it, I understand that. But uh, the last thing we want to do is pass this on to people that their bodies can't handle this. So let's you know, follow all of the government regulations and even though it, you know, it, quite frankly, it sucks, but the reality is we have to do it for the betterment of, of society. So, um, Brady, it's always great having you on. I look forward. That's great. Let's do a summer update and uh, I'll have to look you up when I get back to Colorado and I just always appreciate your time. I'm going to link up uh, your uh, social uh, on the show notes of this podcast. Anybody want to get a hold of Brady, reach out to him. So, God bless, buddy. Thank you. Okay. You as well, Jay. Give me a shot whenever you get up this way. We'll hit the river or something. Okay, sounds good.